A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much for making the time to join the session uh, entitled The Challenges of Scaling Up and Financing Ecosystem-Based Adaptation in Africa uh, and having a critical discussion on the role of innovation and innovative financing solutions. Uh, this event is co-hosted by IUCN, uh, Friends of Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, UNEP, uh, the Global Adaptation Network and the Global Resilience Partnership. And we're all very excited to have you here. Uh, we have a very engaging session planned for all of you. Um, and whilst we all have our CBA hats on, we ask for you to also put on your innovation hat uh, and for us to convene and have diverse perspectives on this interesting and crucial topic, uh, not just for Africa, uh, but for the world in general and the crucial role this will play in building community-based adaptation. Um, Next slide, please, Oscar. So while, while we wait for the slide to change, just a few uh, quick house rules, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, when you're not speaking, please put your microphone on mute. Uh, we encourage you to put your name and organization into the chat so we know who's with us today. Um, and also please feel free to drop in links and resources uh, and drop in questions as well. We do have people who are monitoring the chat who will try and answer you and facilitators as well. Uh, where possible and where time allows, we'll try and address your question when plenary arises. Very quickly to run through the objectives of the session. Um, firstly, we want to create uh, more understanding around the main barriers to scaling and financing EBA in Africa. Many of these barriers will be quite common across uh, a lot of the EBA discussions that are taking place, but we hope to unpack that a bit further, contextualize in terms of Africa and get a better sense uh, of where we stand on this issue. Uh, secondly, we want to interrogate the role of innovation in overcoming these barriers. And certainly innovation is something uh, that is a lot um, as a framing for how to approach challenges, not just for EBA, but across multiple development and climate change areas. So, uh, thirdly, we want to gather diverse perspectives on scaling and financing EBA in Africa, and particularly on the role of innovation, but the role of innovative financing solutions. And it's crucial to gather and, and consider these diverse perspectives. And I'm sure there's a lot of experience in this call. And we really encourage you to bring your experience and your perspectives. Uh, and we have a series of, of opportunities throughout the event for you to do so. And fourthly, we want to discuss current and potential innovative financing solutions and catalytic approaches. Uh, so please do share, 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 and engage. Just to, uh, just to run through the agenda very quickly, um, we'll be having a brief presentation from Dr. Richard Munang, who's the Africa Regional Climate Change Coordinator and also a focal point for EBA FOSA. Uh, we'll be doing a very brief introduction to how the breakout discussions will be run. Um, the second part will be the breakout discussions themselves, focusing on three key barriers identified by the Global Commission on Adaptation's Adapt Now report. I'm sure many of you have come across other reports um, and literature that have tried to define these challenges, but we've tried to keep it a bit simpler for these breakout discussions, but please do bring in uh, that knowledge and that experience. And lastly, part three will uh, give a brief introduction to the nascent Global EBA Fund that IUCN and UNEP um, are working on, um, and then have a plenary discussion specifically on innovative financing solutions that this Global EBA Fund aims to catalyze. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Richard Munung to switch on his microphone and his camera uh, and to give us a brief presentation on removing barriers to upscaling EBA uh, and the crucial need to move from a siloed approach to an integrated approach. Uh, Dr. Munang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Amil, and um, colleagues who are joining in. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I will start my presentation firstly with an African proverb, which goes thus that a forest cannot be cut with a broken axe. I am not advocating for cutting of trees, but just as cutting down a tree calls for effective tools, preserving and enhancing ecosystems that underpin life on the planet is no different. And just as we know, money is sharper than this word. Effective tool is demonstrating the socioeconomic value 
in how EBA can put foot on more tables, more money in more pockets, jobs and enterprises, and catalyze competitive economies. In other words, as the popular saying goes, show me the money. And so where is the money when we talk of EBA or CBA? The recent UNEP and FAO report, which was released just a few days before the World Environment Day, showed that while humanity is already overdrawing ecosystems by up to 1.6 times, restorative action yields a fortune. Every $1 invested in restoration creates up to $30 in economic benefits. That's a 30-fold return. So the message is clear. Reversing ecosystem degradation equates to recouping billions in economic opportunities. These indirect finances are at the core of how EBA unlocks innovative financing opportunities. And Africa's EBA landscape is dotted with pockets of successes from east to west, north to south and central. For example, in Togo, the rehabilitation of catchment areas was shown to drive the renewal of a dam water level. The resulting increase in water availability incentivized local communities to expand tomato farming, and out of these communities were on track not only to reverse poverty, but earn up to 30,000 US dollars per year. In Mozambique, an investment of 120 US dollars per person to rehabilitate depleted mangroves and establish crop farming as alternative livelihoods for coastal communities, restored mangroves, and prevented encroachment on these natural buffers against coastal flooding. These are just few examples, and they go across the entire African continent. EBA across the continent is visibly seen. But the most important aspect we need to understand is that Africa has invested significantly in enabling legal and policy frameworks. As we speak today, 52 out of 54 African countries have ratified the Paris Climate Change Agreement, making Africa the continent with the highest compliance rate. Specific to adaptation, six countries have submitted a national adaptation plan. In addition, relevant to EBA sectoral policies, such as climate smart agriculture, are commonplace in most countries across the continent. What is now needed is to fuse these two critical ingredients for upscaling EBA, a rich array of success stories on one hand, and a high level of strategic and policy goodwill to achieve accelerated upscaling. And this calls for innovations as follows to inform EBA body of knowledge for the next level. And the first is we must divest from silos to complement EBA with value addition. EBA alone might not be able to take us that far. EBA on its own has recorded successes across the continent, but to unlock competitive socioeconomic value, what is needed is that we must add value to what is produced using EBA to maximize socioeconomic opportunities. And this must be done without piling up aggregate emissions that compound climate change. And for this clean energy, a mitigation action should be prioritized. And this does not have to be capital intensive value addition, but rather solutions that are accessible to the majority in the informal sector in the continent. For example, just simple climate action solutions of solar dryers, decentralized to farmers in communities, are proving through the work we do that they can increase earnings up to 30 times of people in communities. The scalability of this approach is multiplied when we consider that Africa is losing 48 billion US dollars each and every year as a result of inefficiency in the entire agro value chain. This means applying EBA alone will only increase losses in ecological resources as resources expended in production and end up homorizing as much the post harvest losses that we're seeing in the continent. But if you combine it with clean energy for value addition, we reverse losses and tap into billion dollar worth of value added enterprises. This is an approach whereby we cannot see adaptation alone, but leverage mitigation to power adaptation. And that takes me to the second point, which is unlocking niche markets through EBA. There is a growing market segment of consumers across the world and most in the continent that pays more for the price of food that is produced, certified in an organic way, that is healthy and is produced in an environmental compliant way. And this fueled by increased public knowledge of the link between what we eat and our health, making consumers more sophisticated on their food choices to prefer validated, natural, validated, non chemicalized food. And this is the niche for EBA. For example, through UNEP's work, 
working with country, what we are seeing working with National Standards Bureau, we are seeing EBA being integrated into national standards and standards guidelines as an affordable, effective technique to achieve compliance to health, safety, and organic standards benchmarks. Through this, we have EBA being upscaled through a market tool where any business willing to have their products certified, they are required to apply EBA. And that takes me to the third point, financial innovations. These are in two dimensions. One is in what I intimated before, where application of EBA is a tool for reversing degradation risk, and by this recoup the billions in socioeconomic opportunities lost each and every year. Commercial banks and microfinancing organizational institutions are critical to this end through implementation of the risking tools. This by mandating use of EBA approaches for farm level activities as a critical for mitigating against climate change induced crop failure. And by this lower the risk profile in agricultural finance that has limited the participation of commercial banks because of perceived high risk. The other dimension is in leveraging informal sector financing structures to finance upscaling of EBA. As we're speaking today, up to 90% of Africans live in the informal sector. They are in the informal sector. They operate outside the mainstream banking system. But most are members of communal cooperatives that are weaved into the community culture. In some countries, cooperatives are responsible for up to about 45% of GDP and 31% of national savings and deposit. The big question is, how this system can be leveraged to finance upscaling of EBA? And the answer lies in what we call co-operating around value-added solutions. What we are seeing from our work across the continent is that actors already using EBA can be structurally guided to convene and cooperate around value-added solutions, assess value addition accessories, like simple climate action solutions or solar dryer. Using these accessories, they can reduce their post-harvest losses and increase their earnings up to 30 times, and this enables them to increase their savings in their local cooperatives. With these savings, they can afford to invest and expand the application of EBA. This forms a virtual cycle of saving and investment by informal sector actors that result in upscaling EBA. And that takes me to the fourth point. You cannot discuss EBA in the continent ignoring Africa's sovereign capital, the youth. We must prioritize human capital, investing in youth by structurally guiding them to continually improve, adapt their skills and talents, and tap into their creativity and ingenuity towards finding purpose in enterprise that upscale EBA is a formidable strategy. And this is what we're doing, leveraging on innovative volunteerism, inspiring young people so that they can find purpose and tap into opportunities. On that direct impact, young people are turning agricultural waste into biofertilizer. And they are providing these accessible organic fertilizer solutions to substitute the costly chemicalized fertilizers. By so doing, they have registered profits to establish an enterprise which becomes a pull factor for increased EBA investment. And that takes me to the last point, policy innovation. Policy is the biggest driver of change, whether we like it or not. But as cited before, Africa sometimes jokingly talked as a cemetery for policy. And yes, it is true. Africa does not lack in EBA policy per se. The gap lies in implementation. And this is because these policies are mostly not empirically informed by proven enterprise actions that are already working on the ground. And by these ensure that they can be more targeted at incentivizing successes so they become the mainstream and not the exception. For example, the climate smart and cultural strategy exposes value addition, which as we have seen, is critical to ensure efficient utilization of ecosystem services. Data in the efficacy of climate action solutions, just simple solar dryers, for example, provides an objective basis for the OPTEC as tools for implementing this climate smart agricultural policy and by this drive EBA and CBA actions. EBA approaches therefore in increasing yields and leveraging on these simple climate action solutions in preventing aflatoxin among informal sector producer was used to recalibrate national food safety standards in Uganda and Nigeria. And this is becoming a win of change across the continent. So what is the point? When data is leveraged and integrated into structures that are not necessarily through EBA, EBA then can be brought to scale even in known environment and known environment ministries or sectors. This integration means that any actor willing to be certified in these standards must apply EBA as a tool for compliance. And by these, we see such policy provisions 
and non-traditional areas leveraging on EBA as a tool for compliance. This is in terms of scaling EBA. So what is the point? We must move away from silo application of EBA alone to an integrated approach. And because this is the only panacea in bringing EBA impact to scale as we create the needed socioeconomic opportunities for youth and transform economies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thanks for this uh, very, very great uh, presentation. Um, I will now be uh, talking about uh, the breakout groups, which are the next part of our uh, session. So the, if you are not aware of what uh, breakout groups are, uh, these are a way uh, to uh, divide the participants and have uh, specific teams that can tackle uh, specific um, challenges and answer specific questions uh, inside uh, breakout groups. So in today's session, we will have three different uh, breakout groups. They will be, each of them, uh, focusing on one of the main uh, categories of barriers to the upscale of EBA and CBA, identified by the Global Commission on Adaptation. As you can see uh, from the screen, and I'm sorry, this is not in presentation mode. Let me just quickly put it in presentation mode. So as you can see from the slide, the first category of barrier is the lack of awareness and understanding of the role of natural assets. The second barrier is the weak policy and regulatory environments and government challenges. And the final barrier is the limited access to finance for applying and scaling up nature-based approaches. So the objective of the breakout discussions really is to link the role of innovation in addressing the respective barriers. And as Amel mentioned in the introduction, this is an interactive uh, discussion, so please feel free to share some thoughts, to share your experience, and also to bring some examples to the discussions. The breakout discussions will last for 25 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for a brief plenary uh, overview of the main key takeaways from the different discussions. You can choose the breakout group uh, you would like to join. Uh, just make sure to join uh, one group where uh, you know you will be able to participate in the discussion and uh, that is of interest for you. When, during the different breakout group, there we have one rapporteur per group that will capture the key uh, takeaways and it will be done during uh, the live presentation. And at the end of uh, each breakout group, we will make sure to keep at least two minutes for all of you to be able to add any key takeaways that are missing from uh, the slide. And finally, after that, we will present all these different key takeaways in the plenary session. So let me now uh, introduce you to our wonderful breakout group host. Um, today, we have three uh, speakers, and I will start by introducing uh, Kretus M. Tonga, who is the executive secretary for the Aqua Farms organization. And we will be hosting the breakout group one on the lack of awareness and understanding. Over to you, Kretus. Um, maybe while Kretus is um, trying to connect, um, maybe we can uh, introduce instead um, Ms. Cecilia Kinutia Njenga, who is the head of the UN Environment Program uh, Office in South Africa and will be hosting the breakout group two on policy and regulation. The floor is yours, Cecilia. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be joining uh, this session uh, this afternoon or morning, whatever the time is, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Cecilia Kinuthia Jenga. I'm the head of the UNEP office. I'm based in Pretoria, South Africa, um, where I also lead a program and project around uh, climate change and specifically ecosystems based adaptation. Uh, this afternoon, I will be uh, facilitating um, Barrier 2, a discussion around Barrier 2, which is on policy and regulatory environments and governance, um, and looking at the challenges that influence the attractiveness and feasibility of using um, these uh, approaches. 
uh, specifically what I'll be seeking uh, as we interact with you in a very inclusive and, uh, and, and participatory manner is um, basically to see how we can strengthen inclusive governance and overcome structural barriers to increase the financing of community-based uh, adaptation and ecosystem-based adaptation in the region. I'll also be wanting us to look at how we can strengthen institutional capacity and take policy to support adaptation scaling, upscaling, as we do know a lot of the activities are happening very much at the local level. And also looking at the national adaptation plans and NDCs, uh, which could be used uh, in support of upscaling uh, and seeking increased financial solutions for CBA and EBA. Uh, I will be seeking to hear from you uh, examples of what you are doing in your various countries, in your various projects, in order to enrich our conversation. I deeply look forward uh, very much uh, to our conversation this afternoon, and I would like to welcome you to consider participating in uh, breakout group two on policy and regulation. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for this good introduction. I will now introduce uh, Ms. Mandy Barnett, who is the Chief Director uh, for Adaptation Policy and Researching for the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And Mandy will be hosting the breakout group three on the lack of finance. Mandy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Oscar, and um, greetings to everybody. Um, as Oscar said, my name is Mandy. I'm from the South African National Biodiversity Institute in South Africa. And we are an institute that sits under the National Department of Environment that works with biodiversity science and policy. And we're also a direct access accredited entity of the Adaptation Fund and Green Climate Fund. So we've got a fair amount of experience working in those um, financing spaces. Um, and we'll be discussing in, uh, in our group barrier number three, which is the limited access to finance for applying and scaling up nature-based approaches. Um, I thought that the introduction from Richard was fascinating. And you know, one of the, the calls to action, Richard, from you was why are we doing this in silos? Um, and you know, why do we separate ecosystem-based mitigation from ecosystem-based adaptation is something that we can ask ourselves as part of that framing. We've got a number of specific questions we'll be asking in the great breakout group, including how can equitable and flexible adaptation finance be strengthened? What is needed to shift to long horizon planning for CBA and EBA? And how can we diversify the investments from different finance sources? One of the questions I'll also be asking the group based on our own experience, is it just access to money that's the problem? And what else do we need to do in our institutional environment to receive and spend that money? So um, I look forward to the discussion and look forward to meeting you, some of you, in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mandy. And now I will try to come back to uh, Mr. Kratis and Tonga. Um, as, as I explained before, he is the executive secretary for the Aqua Farms organization, and he will be hosting the breakout group one on the lack of awareness and understanding. Kratis, over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry for the mic close. Uh, my name is Kratis and Tonga. I work at Aqua Farms organization. Uh, we have uh, been doing a work around mangrove restoration and uh, currently we are in the mentorship stage in partnership with the Ocean Resilience uh, uh, so that uh, to develop the blue carbon project here in Tanzania. As you know, the mangroves people, they depend much on the mangroves. They face pressure, but we want to work with them to make sure they the mangroves are there to protect the coast, and then they gain the benefits from the carbon traded. So I'll be facilitating the, the group on the discussion around the lack of awareness in understanding of the role of the natural assets. I know Dr. Richard already mentioned uh, all the benefits of the ecosystem-based adaptations. And uh, so the question is why, why most of the countries in different situations uh, the countries and regions are, are, are not recognizing this. So we will try to explore the gaps to why uh, there's less awareness on uh, in this case. So you are really welcome to join me on that discussion. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kratis, and thanks again to the three of you for uh, hosting the breakout groups uh, today. So you will now all be able to join the different breakout groups. You should normally be uh, able to click on one icon that is at the bottom of the Zoom window, and it's called Divided into Groups, and you can choose uh, the group that you would like to participate to. So we will uh, wait for everyone to be um, in the different groups, and then we will start the discussions. And of course, we'll all be together again in 25 minutes in the plenary session. So please, uh, you can now all join the different breakout groups. So I will be sharing my screen to um, showcase the different key takeaways from each session. But uh, now I will um, pass the floor to Liz. So Liz, please, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Oscar, and welcome back, everyone. I think we're all trickling back into the main plenary room. I, I had the privilege of being able to jump in and out of the three breakout sessions, and what I saw was extremely invigorating, and I, and I saw a lot of really great conversations happening, so I hope you found the same. And uh, what we'd like to do now is take the next 15 minutes or so to go through uh, some of those key takeaways from each of the three groups, and then um, hopefully we'll have a bit of time also to facilitate a bit of um, discussion between the groups and, and also with um, members who are not in the group but would like to add some information there. And um, we're going to start with, uh, with uh, group one, which was looking at the barrier related to lack of awareness and understanding of the role of natural assets. And this group was facilitated by Cretus and, and supported by Oscar as rapporteur. And Oscar, I see you've already got those key takeaways up on the screen. So I'd like to hand it over to you, Curtis and, and Oscar, um, to, go, to take us through your key takeaways from your session. Curtis, then, would you like to start? Okay, um, in, in the breakout session, we had a really uh, nice discussion on the, the, the issues around lack of awareness and uh, Actually, there's some comment on uh, on the issue. Is it really lack of awareness, knowledge, or capability to communicate this knowledge? And we, uh, I mean, participants mentioned that uh, of course there's lack of awareness and and knowledge at some point, but the really available knowledge and case studies that have proven to work uh, are they really? getting down to the communities and policymakers that was uh another questions that uh, uh yeah even the available knowledge and existing case uh good studies have not been dipped down to the communities maybe on the way they are prepared how how is the message is being packed to fit uh people from diverse group to understand uh what they really mean and there was an example from Lucky Initiative. Uh, uh, we had Lillian from UNFCCC, who they, they've been working on in addressing the knowledge gap. And uh, they, they found that the knowledge was not accessible to everyone. And there was a need to repackage uh, the knowledge. And that's what they've been doing. And, and uh, this has been an issue in implementing the ecosystem-based uh, adaptation because uh, you first need to, un to to educate the communities and then start over explaining to them what you're doing. And then um, apart from that, we talked about innovation uh, and in that way, there was different innovation mentioned by Paul that they're developing systems that uh, they can engage with the public, making sure that they understand the role of uh, ecosystem-based adaptation and also the role of partnerships uh also lillian mentioned on, on on how they are partnering with you know universities and sharing knowledge you know different universities have different expertise at different levels so uh they had a project that uh they share knowledge so knowledge sharing was uh, very important also in raising this kind of awareness in the institutions and also, um, in terms of upscaling uh, these initiatives, there was a very strong point that mentioned that uh, 
We need to really integrate with the communities to understand their needs because they live with nature and they become very attached with nature. And uh, Mike mentioned that uh, there's really needs if we want to upscale innovation could be in form of replication, for instance. But in terms of replication, it's not really necessary that uh, they, they replicate like copy of thing because uh, they should integrate that with the local community based on different usage. Uh, yeah, that's from, from my side. And uh, Oscar, if you have anything to add? Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Kratis. And thanks again for everyone uh, for participating into these great discussions. Um, I think one thing I also want to highlight uh, was um, the fact that it has been mentioned that uh, this transfer of knowledge should not be done only from the global experts and the global community uh, towards the local experts, but also, uh, you know, the indigenous knowledge and the knowledge from the local practitioners and from the local communities should also be brought into uh, the global uh, discussions because this will help uh, the people working in all these big um, institutions and the people who have the funds and who can help um, upscale these different initiatives, uh, it will help them understand what is out there and what is needed. Uh, I think also another very interesting point was the fact that uh, there is maybe a little bit of difficulty sometimes for people to um, be aware of the different funding initiatives and opportunities that are, that are out there. And also maybe it's a little bit difficult for them to access to these different uh, funding opportunities when they are the ones who already have a lot of uh, great innovative solutions that can offer and that can then be uh, upscaled and replicated. So this would be also very interesting to see how we can make sure that all the different funding opportunities, and I'm for instance thinking about the Global EDA Fund, can really um, and just be um, known of all the people working uh, on these initiatives. And we had the last comment about trying to have a better understanding of what is scaling up, um, which also I think is a great uh, future discussion uh, that we will have. So thanks a lot, uh, everyone. I don't know if anyone else from the group maybe wants to add something. Uh, maybe we're already over the time. So Liz, um, maybe over to you. Or oh, I see that Thank James you. has raised his hand, so maybe, yeah. Thanks so much. Yes, please, James, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, concerning the awareness, um, I'm of this opinion with the community base because most of uh, discussion here are talking of the local people at the local level. Uh, a demonstration would take us a long way uh, consigning the normal phenomenon of uh, the EBA approach with other system venues. For instance, the area of uh, uh, climate smart agriculture, I'm taking a scenario of agriculture, a demonstration needed with the local people to see the difference between what result EBA will bring and the result the other area of innovations will, uh, will bring. Uh, ditto for the way, uh, especially the area of, uh, like in the Bafusa, the Eco Assembly of the Agriculture, uh, the Bafusa Angu Food Security Assembly, where we have the youth already demonstrating the use of uh, uh, solar energy in the value addition. You know, when you are bringing the area of uh, uh, social economic and environment, the people who adopt to social economic, the one that put more money in their pocket, rather than thinking the environment, whether the climate is changing or not, it's not a business. So we must be able to have to prove a proof of concept to them that this thing is working and that's what Bafusa Nigeria is doing with our youth, uh, coordinated by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Munak. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And I, I, I hear that that role of the um, making, making the uh, added value clear and involving youth, I think those are extremely um, important points to raise in this area and probably in the other groups as well. As we go through these, this recap in this uh, plenary session, I'd like to welcome everybody who's in the session to please do ask your questions. Um, you may direct them to a specific group. If there's anything you'd like to add, if you weren't in the group, but you would like to uh, ask a question or add any points or, or make a, a parallel to maybe one of the discussions you had in your own group, I very much welcome that in the chat. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get to those questions during this session. Um, I'm going to move over now to group two and ask uh, Cecilia, as well as our, our rapporteur for the group, uh, Jesper, if they can present 
their key takeaways, and I see them up on the screen. Um, breakout group two is looking at policy and regulation, and I will I will hand over to you for a few minutes of, of recap of your key takeaways. Over to you, Cecilia. And thank you very much, Lisa. We had an extremely vibrant uh, conversation uh, in group two, and I'll just highlight uh, some of the key um, messages and takeaways from this group. I'll call them nuggets uh, and also allow other uh, group members to, to, to contribute. I think what we agreed in this group is that policy is the biggest driver of change, um, and it's really the way to break silos. We recognize that there is need for more better policy coherence. Uh, we do find EBA policies cutted across uh, all kinds of policy in agriculture, in commerce, in environment, in water, et cetera. So the need for a much more uh, coherent approach uh, in policy making. But we also identified that uh, current policies are quite weak. Um, they are not strong enough uh, in order for us to uh, very ably uh, be able to uh, address and integrate uh, EBA into policy making, leave alone uh, the budgeting aspects um, of our process. And where policies exist, we also realized uh, that there is uh, enforcement, particularly of legislation, is quite weak. So the need for us to strengthen legislation, so have policies, but also have an enforcement framework in place in order for us to achieve that. We realize that empowerment is key, uh, that people do development for themselves. So a policy framework is an enabler for action and for real transformation where people take responsibility uh, for, uh, you know, take responsibility uh, for real uh, transformation in integrating EBA. We also realize that the current development discourse uh, of philosophy is lacking in terms of having an EBA um, content in it. And therefore the need for us, uh, and one of our participants said, which should be business unusual, uh, not business as usual in terms of just adding in EBA, but really transforming uh, the way our development discourse is currently uh, being uh, developed. The existing planning system also does not take into cognizance EBA and therefore the tools, approaches and methodologies uh, that infuse EBA uh, need to be better streamlined. Um, we spoke a lot around the whole issue of institutional strengthening uh, and how can we effectively and practically do this. And we had an example from James that emphasized the need perhaps for a policy task force Again, that is multi-departmental, multi-ministerial, you know, agriculture, environment, commerce, industry represented in this task force that can drive uh, policy change. Uh, we also talked about the whole essence of community governance, uh, cooperative uh, governance at the local level and being very critical uh, in terms of driving change and ensuring that local development plans and policies are very well understood at the local level and that people and communities have a, a role in decision making, etc. We also talked about public-private partnerships and policies that support uh, this collaboration uh, being crucial in terms of looking after our ecosystems, but also the need for policy harmonization and coherence. We, uh, we noted the lack of data that evidence-based policy making, evidence-based decision making can only be effective if we have adequate data uh, that can inform policy and be able to influence the decisions that are being made. But we also emphasize the importance of citizen science and indigenous knowledge has been critical uh, in this process. The need for inclusive uh, policy making and implementation backed by gender analysis uh, and being people-centered uh, being extremely crucial. Uh, Richard Munang emphasized the need of what he calls participatory democracy. Uh, people do development for themselves. And therefore, uh, the democratic process in terms of our governance structure uh, should be empowering uh, and should provide the necessary tools so that people uh, can be able uh, to participate in their socioeconomic development. As I said, it's not business as usual, it's business and you as unusual in the policy landscape. Uh, we need to demonstrate and show the value uh, of what EBA brings into the developmental and sustainable development process. 
uh, by showing in real terms and practical terms the socioeconomic dimension uh, through evidence and data. Are we increasing yields? Are we improving the soils? Are we creating new jobs? Are we creating new jobs, et cetera? We need to have this information and data uh, to influence policy. And we also emphasized the popular statement that climate adaptation solutions are powered by mitigation and could be able to leverage from the non-environmental sectors, both in the socio uh, and economic realms. So we had quite a rich co uh, contribution and I'd just like to stop there and allow others uh, to add their voice on this key takeaways. Thanks, please. Thanks so much, Cecilia. And I'd like to ask anyone who would like to add, uh, anyone who is in group two who'd like to add anything to that uh, already excellent overview of the discussion. Um, anyone else would like to jump in, please feel free to do so now. And I'd also like to remind everybody who's in the session now with us, please do give your, your reactions, feedback, questions or comments in the chat and we'll be happy to get to those as well. I'd also like to give a, a warm thank you, in fact, to, I believe it was Amber who jumped in to be the rapporteur for this session. So thank you so much for that, Amber, Bier for doing so, uh, appreciate the flexible uh, action on that. All right, Cecilia, I will say thank you very much for your excellent work facilitating that session. And I'm going to jump over to um, the key takeaways from group three. Um, and here we had uh, Mandy Barnett facilitating the session with support from Wendy. And um, the group three was looking at lack of finance. So I'd like to ask if Mandy or Wendy can very kindly uh, put your slide up on the screen with your key takeaways and I will hand over to you to go through those. Thanks so much Liz and um, while the slide is coming up really just thank you so much to the participants because it was a really fascinating session and one that was way too short because as soon as we discovered a really interesting topic, we discovered another really interesting topic. Um, and of course, it really suggests that we all need more time to be able to really explore these fascinating um, concepts. Um, and of course, I really wish we could all just move out to a in-person coffee break, where we could have this discussion in that way. So of course, these virtual meetings are great, but they, they stop us from being able to interact in that way. So let's all look forward to a life post COVID where we can all interact in a more um, spontaneous way. Uh, but thank you so much, Wendy, for, for capturing our barriers. Um, one of the main, and, and so first of all, what is fascinating about the group is that the, the, the lessons or the nuggets, as Cecilia called them, came from practice. And you'll see that coming through. These are not abstract in theory things. The, these are, are things that come from the real experience of the participants. Um, and the first one was that it's not about, or not just about new money, but substantially about leveraging existing resources. And we've heard that a lot today. You know, how do we in a way mainstream this EBA conversation into service delivery, into you know, everything we do? So we're not just looking to the donors to save us, but we're looking at how do our own systems in a, in, in a then sustainable systemic way start to respond to the need to integrate these issues. Um, we then spoke quite a lot about, um, this was something that, that, that Richard triggered, um, I think just, I mean, not that it wasn't there already, but that he reminded us the potential of unlocking the youth. And we heard from the EPIC project, which has been in the chat as well, just around how empowering youth to engage with communities is efficient, is effective, is able to integrate local and indigenous knowledge into the practice and really something that has been done and we need to do more. So that was really interesting. So there's the leveraging local knowledge um, idea. There was a very interesting example from the DRC about community inclusion currencies which again was another way of catalyzing the economies around doing this kind of work. Um, providing support to local communities in a way that we add value. So, so um, the, the, sorry, our ideas are a little bit all over the place here, but and that one is a little linked to the value chain one that is lower down. So I won't do something unless it's in my long-term interest to do that. So how do we build local economies, local socioeconomic systems um, that make it 
not just about pilots in art with external funding, but about really talking to the interests of communities. And there, there were some really nice examples in agriculture, the formation of cooperatives to, you know, access markets um, jointly, um, you know, shorten value chains, those sorts of things. Um, then we spoke about, um, we touched on the issue of the complexity of the foreign donor or external donor funding systems. And how as we develop these new terminologies and these new requirements, um, I can go on about that in my own work, but things like how long does it take you to develop a climate rationale? What we do is we take the money away from where it's supposed to go and end up with lots of money in the system and not a lot of money on the ground. So how do we change that? So we start to enable local actors, and there's the youth coming in again, to, to be more, to have more agency in the way these funds are accessed and used um, and, and, and stop building these systems that require such complexity that um, we end up putting all the resources in, in the wrong places. Uh, we spoke a little about, a bit about subsidies, noting that there are many subsidies that actually are perverse subsidies for, um, for conservation, um, for, for local development, and can we eliminate those and uh, put those resources instead into our adaptation, um, conservation, livelihood efforts? So let's look at the whole system, um, not just at these small things that sometimes are in conflict when you look at the whole system. Um, we need to, of course, engage the different actors. We've heard that quite a lot. Um, and then there's this issue about stop the piloting, start the doing. So again, it's the stop, start, piloting all the time instead of going, this is not a rehearsal, this is life. Um, so how do we bring um, our efforts into shifting our systems instead of doing these demonstration pilots all over the place that start and end and arguably don't have that much um, benefit for local, um, for local adaptation um, or local climate change response efforts. Um, we touched a little bit on the issue of scaling up, saying that there's big pressure to scale up adaptation work, CBA, EBA, which comes from what happens in mitigation. Mitigation, it's very easy to scale. Adaptation, we're still very granular. We're working on the ground with local communities. We cannot scale in the same way um, without eroding our principles. So there's been a lot of talk about the adaptation principles over CBA. And you know, what do we need to do to be pushing back against this? You have to scale um, because, and, and what does that mean for our principles if we go to scale and, and then lose the, 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 the sort of um, principles and, and the values on which this, this work needs to be best? So I think I've covered most of it. Um, one more point just to pick up is that um, this idea of doing long term scaled up effort conflicts sometimes with the short term finance availability. So once again, how do we look at the system to the adaptation principles touch on this idea of long term patient predictable finance? Um, and of course, that's critical um, if we're to do long term sustained scalable work. Um, and, um, and of course, that ties in to, um, hang on, let me just find my train of thought. Um, goodness, I've completely lost my train of thought, but that's quite a lot of ideas already coming from the group and maybe some of the other group members want to add before we go to the broader group. Thank you so much. Mandy, that was fantastic. And I think that it was it was so rich. I wish that we could listen to the, the outcomes of group three and also groups two and one for the next 45 minutes. And I'm, I'm really gratified by seeing the conversations happening in the chat as well. I'd like to just open up to ask if there's anyone else from group three that would, that would like to add anything to that conversation or any points that might have might have been missed. Although that was a very, very rich recap. I'd like to welcome anyone to continue the conversation in any group that you were in, please do continue to uh, add thoughts and ideas in the chat as we go through the rest of the session today. And I just wanted to um, point out some of the things that I really heard um, uh, Mandy and others say in their recap that really, um, really stuck out to me, which I found very impactful statements. And one of those, I really liked the stop the piloting and start the doing, um, that was fantastic. Um, you also raised a fantastic question, Mandy, about the scalability of adaptation, whether it is by its nature, um, whether we need local solutions, whether adaptation needs to happen at the local level, how scalable is it? Um, and the fact that mitigation is probably infinitely more scalable than adaptation in many ways. 
Um, so it's, it's a very interesting question is how, we, how do we scale up ad adaptation when the solutions are often quite local? Um, I really enjoy in the chat, I enjoy seeing discussions around values. And also discussion here, someone, Melvin van der Veen, um, there's power in local and traditional knowledge. And that's one of the things I think we heard really in all three of the groups, that power in local knowledge and the need to translate information and knowledge to a local level so that it can be acted upon at the local and smallest um, possible level. At the same time, I believe it was group two that raised the need of co-creating knowledge at the local level as well. So that the role of citizen scientists is a, fantastic, um, is a fantastic one. So people aren't just users of knowledge and information, they are also creators of it. And how can we uh, enable that? How can we link into that? I believe all three groups and also my colleague Richard at the beginning of the session really touched upon the, the power of engaging youth. And that's, I was very gratified to hear that come out so richly in each of the discussions. And I also, I also heard a lot about incentivizing action um, and really looking at uh, taking a systems approach to look at um, the incentives that are around uh, ecosystem-based adaptation including the need to grow local economies. And so that, that question came up a lot, or that issue came up a lot throughout um, all three of these groups and um, excellent to hear. I really heard a lot of commonalities. I do see that we've got a hand raised and I'd just like to ask you, Richard, you've got your hand up and so do you, James. Um, please do jump in now before we re uh, hand over to the next part of our session. I welcome you to provide a comment. Maybe Richard, why don't you go first? Yeah, thank you very much, Liz, uh, for that beautiful summary. I think you've touched uh, most of the points that uh, I wanted to uh, raise. But what I just wanted to say is that at the end of the day, in as much as um, we have knowledge gaps, there is also the bigger gap, which is the inspiration gap. And if you can see on the chart, there is the mention of also leveraging on local institutions. So we need to inspire people so that they can become passionate to pick up what they have and build on it. If not, we might have everything, but we'll never have the people because inspired people and passionate people can actually be the force to reckon with when it comes to taking EBA forward. So inspiration gap, a key point for EBA to be brought to scale. Thank you. I love that, Richard. The inspiration gap is something we need to overcome. I can tell we should rename the title of the session <laughs> to overcoming the inspiration gap. That's fantastic. I think that's a great segue. Also, um, the conversation from group three, which looked at financial barriers, uh, um, it's a great segue to the next part of our, of our session today, which is where we're going to be introducing the Global EBA Fund to you, um, which is a recently launched fund um, uh, that we'll, we'll tell you more about now. And, and we're really overcoming um, barriers to EBA, as well as looking for innovative and catalytic um, uh, responses is really a core part of the fund. And that's um, the heart of what we are we are um, aiming to get at it today's session. So I'd very warmly like to welcome my colleague Wendy Atieno of IECN and Nora Ngeni of UNEP to take us through uh, a brief presentation about the Global EBA Fund. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Liz. And um, my name is Nora Ngeni. As Liz has just introduced me, I'm working with uh, UNEP to support the Global EBA Fund in close collaboration with IUCN. I'm very glad to be part of this rich, really rich discussions that we're having today on the barriers to ecosystem-based adaptation. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the Global EBA Fund here today. Um, I'll start with a short background presentation and the second segment will be covered by my counterpart, um, Wendy Ateno from IUCN. So what is the EBA Fund? The fund is a quickly deployable mechanism for supporting innovative approaches to ecosystem-based adaptation with an aim of helping people to adapt to the adverse um, effects of climate change. This fund was launched earlier this year and uh, has had one round of um, applications so far with a second round coming up later, uh, which will be detailed further in the presentation. So the fund is uh, funded by the Federal Environment Ministry of Germany through its International Climate Initiative, ICI, and uh, which has currently committed about 20 million euros to the fund. The fund is co-led by UNEP and IUCN, uh, who have been using the existing and extensive networks, tools, as well as their expertise in the field of adaptation and using the networks such as global networks, such as the Global Adaptation Network by uh, UNEP and the Friends of EBA, uh, which is an IUCN network. 
um, leveraging on this to build on the growing momentum around uh, nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation, and as well as creating synergies between the project and other upscaling initiatives. So what is the purpose of a fund? As mentioned, Iki committed 20 million euros to the fund with an aim of addressing specific gaps in policy and technical knowledge by providing rapid and targeted financial support to both innovative as well as catalytic projects. The fund has also had, um, is also focused on a breed, broad thematic focus of uh, innovation as well as urgency for climate change adaptation, closing of resources and uh, knowledge gaps, as well as encouraging creative and catalytic solutions and partnerships among fund applicants. Please go to the slide before. Thanks, Oscar. So the fund is also prioritizing the closing of resources. Um, the, the fund has three strategic um, objectives, which are addressing awareness, planning, as well as the finance gaps and seeking potentials for scaling up, which all align to the EBA barriers that we've actually been discussing today as developed by the, um, as put forward by the Global Commission of Adaptation. My colleague will speak a little further on the funds about the catalytic and innovative EBA interventions, um, which will feed into these discussions that we're having today. Next slide, please. So what exactly do we fund? So the EBA fund, um, the global EBA fund uh, provides grants of between 50 to 250,000 for single or multi-country project, um, projects. The fund does not have any specific or prioritized regional or country focus. However, all the countries, whether individual or multi-country projects uh, must be uh, ODA eligible. And all this information can be found on our website under the tab, uh, what we fund. So the fund also prioritizes applicants who are well grounded in the proposed region or in the area of work that has been proposed and are required to have expertise of the size or the type of grant that's actually proposed. We look to work with the local communities um, utilizing or capturing and uh, harnessing indigenous knowledge as well as gender perspectives um, in these projects. Okay. Examples of some of the recipients of these funds include uh, local and international NGOs with relevant EP experience, CBOs, uh, research organizations, think tanks, global and regional scientific communities, private sector amongst others. However, we'd just like to note that UNEP and IUCN offices are not eligible to apply, neither are our governing partners. However, organizations who work directly with national, subnational, or local governments can be able to apply to the fund. For more detailed information on all of this, we welcome you to visit our website, www.globalebafund.org. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to now uh, hand over to Ms. Wendy Atieno, who's going to take you through the next portion of this presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and thank you, Nora. Um, as Nora said, my name is Wendy Atieno, and I work with IUCN's Ecosystem Management Program, and e specifically in ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, and so in its first call for proposals, the Global EBA Fund has received over 275 applications across 75 countries, with 13 projects being regional projects and five global projects. So really speaking to the global nature of, of the fund, um, representative organizations have included, as Nora had pointed out initially, um, CBOs, IB, IPOs, NGOs, um, the whole alphabet soup, um, private and private sector as well. So drawing from some of the conversations we've been having. Um, and in this way, this, this is just the beginning. Um, the aim of the fund is to target innovative EBA approaches that result in catalytic impact. Um, Oscar, could you please go to the next slide? In the time that we've had, numerous actors in EBA have been implementing EBA for over 10 years, generating evidence, knowledge. We've been piloting actions throughout this whole time. And so now we're looking for projects that add value to or upscale the existing knowledge. Um, going back to the question of what we fund, you know, it has to be EBA. So aligned with the FIBA EBA qualification criteria and quality standards, um, this idea of catalytic impact, we want to see you know, what is the what is this work going to lead to? Broadening the impact, the idea of scaling as well. And you want to add value. Um, as this work has been implemented on the ground, what are the gaps that I've been identified? 
what is knowledge that needs to be generated, what is a very focused approach that seeks to target a particular initiative. And it doesn't have to be EBA specifically. It could be integrating EBA into a traditional conservation project, integrating EBA, um, looking at the lessons to be drawn from climate smart agriculture and how that aligns with EBA. So all of these are just very, very broad examples. Um, and again, this is part of an iterative process, learning from action on the ground, um, learning from research and seeking non-traditional EBA actors, many of whom are represented here. Um, in line with uh, the tagline for CBA is looking at local action, um, generating global action. And so what do we mean about um, catalytic interventions? Oscar, could you go to the next slide? These are just some of the examples. Um, it's very difficult, I would say, to define catalytic. It's very, uh, rather, it's very difficult to define innovation. And we feel that if we do define it, then we're restricting it. Um, however, we wanted to provide some examples as a jumping off point um, that um, applicants can build on. So some of these are directed research on overcoming EBA barriers. Um, we've identified three, but you know, what else is out there? Um, pilot of demonstrating actions with high potential for upscaling. And this is important, not just piloting an action on its own in a vacuum, it's piloting an action to show linkages and potential for upscaling. So moving past the piloting to the actual doing. Um, one exception for the pilot actions is looking at innovative or unproven innovation um, approaches for EBA. What is out there that the EBA community is not currently thinking about that um, as implementers, as actors, you feel very strongly that this is the missing piece that needs to be addressed. Um, thinking about strategic and focused EBA policy mainstreaming, um, as we've talked a lot about financing today, innovative finance mechanisms for EBA, as well as bringing in the private sector and incentivizing private sector investment in EBA and de-risking lending approaches. Um, overall, there's the idea of pairing up um, innovative partnerships and collaborations, um, looking at unlikely matches, thinking about diverse actors, um, breaking down silos was a point that was mentioned earlier, um, and pushing toward an integrated approach. So there was the idea that came up in group two, um, talking about business unusual. Um, untraditional approaches such as, you know, looking at the social economic dynamics and I'm borrowing entirely from um, Celia's presentation, um, thinking about One Health, we're talking about the impacts of COVID on, on the world and the economy, what, do, what role does eBay have to play on this? Um, thinking about technology, humanitarian response, neglected ecosystems. These are just very broad ideas, um, but again, we look to the actors on the ground to inform this process. Um, what is something that we need to learn to be able to better implement EBA? And with that, and thinking about um, innovation, I would like to pass on to my colleague, Adam Borsin, who's the team lead um, of innovative finance and system change at the Danish Red Cross um, to facilitate the plenary on innovative financing solutions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate the time and um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about what we've heard today. And um, just to brief you, uh, the Danish Red Cross um, has offices around the world. I'm actually based in, uh, in Woodstock, but I was in Ethiopia for a couple of years before COVID. Um, the way the Danish Red Cross looks at innovation is less about the finance mechanism and more about the system, which is really interesting that we're here today talking about um, this topic. So, um, just to sort of put down a layer, when we think about innovative financing, um, we tend to think about it as a range of non-traditional mechanisms that blend public and private capital. And it could be done through a repayable finance solution. It could be a risk transfer. It could be anything really that um, allows us to look at humanitarian development um, goals in a more uh, creative um, and outcome-based approach. And so I kind of want to ask a couple of questions based on some of the information and some of the conversations I've heard today. Um, I think a big question in my mind that I would love to throw out there is around um, an EBA solution and how would it actually work across an entire ecosystem? Because we are talking about ecosystems. And if you break an ecosystem down, there's different value points. There's, it's, a, it's a value chain and there's different entry points from farm to fork, they like to say. So if we're thinking about catalytic solutions, if we're thinking about innovation and we're thinking about financing and accessing at different points in that value chain, then how would we 
create a solution that actually addresses that. And then the second part is, how does that actually work in practicality? Um, and so I'd like to open that to the floor and, and see if there's any um, conversation around that. So if you have, uh, I can't see everybody's hand, but if you wanna just chime in, uh, please, please jump in. Can you repeat the question again, please? Maybe- uh, uh, Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the question is in the context of EBA, which is an ecosystem approach to adaptation and climate, how would we um, look at creating a solutions that actually go across the entire ecosystem? In some cases, we may hit at one point in the value chain. Perhaps it's financing for a farmer to be able to do a rainwater harvesting solution. But then how does that help get their product to market? Right? So is it possible to, for us to talk about EBA without actually thinking about the entire value chain from a financing perspective? And if we do that, what are some examples or how does that look? Right? And then what exactly is necessary for us all to be able to work together? What does that enabling environment look like? Because if we really want to move the needle here and we want to get away from piloting, we want to step it up and think about the entire system, right? So I'm curious to know some of the experience on the, on the crew here. Okay, please jump in. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Um, I think that's a very important uh, perspective, uh, though it's a question, but it's bringing a different perspective, which is pretty much uh, providing uh, that added impetus to the topic of the discussion, which is how do we break from silos? And I think from the uh, discussions that we had today, the idea is that EBA is part of a strategy. It is not an end, but it's part of a means to an end. And because it is part of a means to an end, it then stops somewhere if it is not connected by other enablers. So I'll call them enablers. So you have enablers of finance. So if a mother is using nature-based approaches uh, and applying organic fertilizer and then at the end of the day have bumper harvest, it gets spoiled. If then value-added technologies and innovations are not brought in, for example, a simple solar dryer, for example, cool storage or a refrigerator, but that is not in the docket of ecosystem, but it's an innovation that enables the food not to be wasted. And as a result of that, you can then be able to either dry it, use a solar dryer, store it in a fridge or in a solar fridge, which is a clean energy technology as well, and then sell it later and put more money in more pockets and go back to use that EBA. But then another aspect comes in now, which is market incentive, which is quite very important aspect of the market incentives from the perspective that the standards and the approaches that are being used to take EBA actually align not only to national policies, but align to the national standards regulation, for example, did the actions work with environment or did they work against environment? Were they done in a way that is safety? Then that fetches a market beyond the immediate region in which that farmer is or that individual is, and it goes beyond even the country now with Africa continental free trade, where what is produced in Kenya could fetch a market in Kudivua or in Togo, but there are certain standards that needs to be. Uh, and then the last part, which I think we need to look, which is part of this continuum, is now the aspect which I alluded to earlier, the policy innovations, which came out here very, very strongly. <laughs> Having EBA not only in environmentally related policies, but EBA even in energy policy, whereby we are talking about solar powered irrigation here. Yes, the solar power irrigation is has not, not an eco, it's an innovation that will help power resilience that would then ensure that soils are intact, they rejuvenate the uh, soil chemical processes, they ensure that at least the um, adaptive capacity or ability of communities can be enhanced, especially. So the system thinking is not a one size fit all, but it is what is needed. And now then the local institutions of financing, which is now cooperative, why will a mother go to a cooperative and get money to go and invest in organic um, biofertilizer or biofertilizer or in agroforestry when the returns are not high. But if the returns are high from the perspective that she'd have a see her crop and then uh, add value to it and make more money, then she will save more and then apply more agroforestry techniques and the cycle. So it's a vicious, it's, it's a virtuous cycle, so to speak. And that kind of thinking needs to bring everyone together 
But what we end up having is that we have EBA uh, uh, champions discussing EBA with EBA champions who are already converted, then leaving at those who are supposed to bring enablers in terms of innovations from policy uh, to um, uh, markets to uh, financing. And more importantly, even the constituency, which is more important, the youthful constituency get missing out here, but EBA needs to pitch to them from the jobs perspective, from the socioeconomic opportunities and enterprise development that they're supposed to look at. I was told that. Thanks, thanks, Richard. That's that's fantastic. Um, so we have uh, Kretis and then James and uh, Maria. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I, I want to share one experience on what we are doing here in Tanzania. We are working with uh, all RRI, so it's a resilience partnership. And uh, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop a community-based blue carbon project. And uh, in this project is uh, we are creating partnership with organizations like Plan Vivo and the Ocean Resilience Partnerships, which have the whole group of, you know, investors and you know mentors who can who provides this knowledge to the grassroots level so right now uh, what we are planning to do in this project is uh, we will quantify the amount of carbon uh, within the mangroves that has been sequenced by the trees over the year and then from this then we can you know in partnership with plan vivo we can try to resell back this carbon and then we get money that uh, gets back to the communities to create alternative livelihood and build resilience. So in that way, we are solving one problem of you know, having alternatives in the local communities, but also this ecosystem there in the coastal areas, that means that provides additional benefits like coastal protection, and then the, the nursery area for fish, so in this kind, this system have proven to work in the coastal areas like Gazi in Kenya, but uh, still the knowledge is uh, like very low in Tanzania. It's uh, if it's gonna be successful, it's gonna be the very first project in uh, the carbon project in Tanzania, and uh, I think we should in also invest more to get back to the previous discussion in in making sure that. Uh, different people in different regions, they understand uh, one of uh, this financing mechanism, one of these. Okay. Is Great, thank you so much. So just let me take one second to comment, to comment on that. We're talking about innovative financing here in some ways, right? And so if in that context, if we think about mangroves and climate and adaptation, there's two points. There's maintenance, there's regeneration of it. There's also insurance you could use to protect it. You could create trust funds. You could think about the carbon offsetting. So there's a lot of streams here. And so what I was pushing um, the, the group to think about is across in a value chain from point A to point B to point C, where are the points that we can link all the different financing tools and solutions together so that they're blended? Who needs to be there? What has to happen for that to take place? So that's a great comment. Um, I'm gonna move over to James. Really quickly, we have like three minutes left and then over to Maria, um, and we'll see if we can get another person up. So to you, James. Thank you. Um, uh, the issue of uh, EBA, I could call it to be EBA and value addition. Uh, the process where can now be area of uh, financing the EBA, without the area of value addition, we go nowhere. Uh, the value addition in terms of uh, using clean energy, we go a long way in mitigation because the issue of uh, making use of fossil fuel being replaced by clean energy will reduce the effect of release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And basically, EBA approach also, I mean, enhance the issue of carbon dioxide in the soil. You know, we have the greatest number of carbon dioxide in the soil more than the one in the atmosphere. So EBA perspective in the organic putting the uh, soil structure and texture in place, we keep the carbon dioxide in the soil, and that's the area of mitigation. Apart from the adaptive measure that the farmers will be able to do that will increase infiltration and percolation of water. Let me okay. go back to the of value so, addition. So James, way. just to connect it yeah. back to the financing part. So you're talking yes, about- Yes, the, the finance perspective capture. is yeah. along the value chain. When you finance the clean energy, 
added in terms of value addition to the product that will enhance the sales of it. Like I said, if the importation of that will enhance more money in the pocket of who are producing it, it will have to it and will increase the area of uh, uh, financing. People will be able to finance more. And the area of public private partnership, that thing will come in and finance will be upscaled. Great. Thank you. Very, very important point. Maria, you got a minute. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Adam. I just want to just add on to the renewable energy <laughs> value chain thing. Uh, we work with small water farmers and we've brought in solar power irrigation, but I then go back to what uh, Dr. Richard said earlier. The systems, uh, there was no systems mapping which was done. So even if we brought in and established agroecology and ecosystem based uh, gardens in there, we didn't do a hydrological mapping. We didn't bring in the engineers. We, be, we didn't even bring in uh, even the environmental management agencies to work with us. So there's also all those aspects which also need to, to come into play because even if we introduce uh, specific value chains and we get them to the market actors, the natural systems also need to be linked enough so that the ecosystems balance is not disturbed in a way that uh, at the moment, we don't have ways of replenishing that water because of the solar power irrigation uh, just going on and on and people are just drilling boreholes, but we're not looking at how do we then feed back into and replenishing the natural ecosystems. So I think that is something which we should never uh, forget to keep at the back of our minds whenever we are talking about uh, value chains and EB. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Maria. Um, so there's a big discussion around grassroots, um, being able to have grassroots uh, related solutions. How do we finance that? That's probably a whole other conversation that we could have. How can we make tools for individual um, communities to spin up their own projects and be sustainable and regenerative? That could be another three hour conversation, but I have to stop there. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Amber Bier from IUCN, and she's gonna take over from here. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam, and everyone else for providing your insights on innovative financing solutions, especially as related to EBA and climate adaptation. What a great way to finish off this very packed session. I now have the pleasure to present some very brief closing remarks to be um, aware of everyone's time um, for the whole session. So as Adam mentioned, my name is Amber Pierre and I am a part of IUCN's Global Ecosystem Management Program, specifically on the EBA or Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Team. Today, you've heard from a diverse set of voices, including some of my colleagues, including Wendy from IUCN, my fellow Global EBA Fund facilitators from UNEP and GAN, Liz, Nora, and Oscar, and our colleagues from GRP, Emil and Jesper. You've also heard from a further diversified set of voices, including, but not limited to, Richard, Cretus, Cecilia, Mandy, and Adam who are all engaged in various sectors of climate adaptation, finance, and much, much more. So thank you each for your unique contributions throughout today's discussions. And in the spirit of discussions, I'll now sh share some of the key takeaways from today's event, which I know have been sort of highlighted elsewhere and they're on the screen. So thank you, Oscar, for sharing. Um, so first, appropriate innovative EBA approaches must prioritize the needs of local communities. And that includes not only youth and gender and other perspectives, but also including local and traditional knowledge. And this needs to happen from the start of the project development and continue engagement for the long term to ensure buy-in from the community even after the project duration has passed. Second, it's crucial to overcome the siloed approach and adopt an integrated approach to developing, financing, and implementing EBA which I know we've heard about a lot. And this tagline of moving away from business as usual to moving toward business unusual. Next, gender equality and social inclusion are crucial when discussing, planning and implementing these innovative approaches, including innovative financial solutions for EBA across Africa and indeed across the globe. And finally, we not, must now move from piloting to full scale projects and programs. Monitoring, evaluation, and learning is a critical component of that, ensuring to catalyze access to novel sources of finance. And 
So clearly this session covered a wide breadth of topics, but we want to hear from you one more time before we log off. If Oscar switches to the next slide, you'll see a QR code, which you can scan on your phone um, to participate in a survey. I've also just dropped the link to the survey in the chat and I see Nora has as well. Um, note also that at the end of this survey, which is a great way to sort of show your feedback on our session and also um, provide innovation or provide insights on innovative financing. And then at the end of this survey, there's another survey that's a bit longer focusing on ev gathering evidence on how to overcome the barriers we address today. So the longer survey provides a space for you to share your case studies and experiences in a more extensive way. As you take a few moments to complete the survey, I'd like to also mention that information from this session will be posted on the CBA 15 website. We will include links to learn more about the hosting organizations and all relevant materials mentioned in the chat, including the Global EBA Fund. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all participants on behalf of the hosts of the CBA 15 session. We have heard encouraging contributions from decision makers, program implementers, practitioners, on-ground partners, interested parties, and many, many more individuals from across the globe. Thank you each for sharing your perspectives in the plenary and in breakout sessions. In order to scale up ecosystem-based adaptation and nature-based solutions more broadly, to create real impact and real climate action, we need more individuals like you all that attend a conference, even though it may be virtual, to learn from your colleagues and share your experiences. We look forward to seeing you at further CBA 15 sessions and into the future as we head into a summer full of events and negotiations before an autumn full of events, including the IUCN World Conservation Congress, the CBD COP15, the UNFCCC COP26, and much, much more. I'd also like to extend my sincere gratitude to fellow organizers from GRP, UNEP, IUCN, and of course, the back-end organizers of CBA 15 from IIED. Thank you each for your time and for bearing with our time zone differences. So again, thank you to everyone. And with that, I wish you all the best. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are in the world.